Hi guys, it's Sarah and Nick. How are you all? So um, I think we're bang on time getting started. I can see there's still a few people logging in and numbers are going up. Um, if you're online and you can hear me, can you just whack a little hello in the comments box so that we know that you can hear us and we can see you. Excellent, so we've got David, Chris, Phil. Hi guys, hi Justin. <laughs> Justin, I hope you've done your messaging today. Justin's one of my students on my session, on my um, one to one. Yeah, cool. Hi, Sarah. Hi, Raj. Raj, Raj, Raj. Safe. Tom, Safe, Safe, Saf. <laughs> Your nickname, the Quiff. Hi, Sarah, and the Quiff. Yeah, yeah, that's me because of the. the quiff. <laughs> I didn't know that. That's quite cool. So, <laughs> guys, um. First of all, thank you, thank you for being online tonight. Obviously, there's a million other places you could be, and you've chosen to spend the evening with us, which is always very flattering. Um, tonight's plan of action is as follows. We're going to do about an hour. Um, we are really concentrating more on the live Q&A at the end than um, delivering you millions of slides and things like that. So it's more about you guys and creating the content that you want to hear. Um, Nick and I, this is the first session Nick and I have ever done together. Um, we come from very different backgrounds, very different locations in the country and have probably got quite different opinions on things, although there is a lot of similarities as well. So it's going to be a really interesting session for Nick and I, as well as you guys, I think. Um, we're going to do about an hour and we're going to do um i'm going to go through some just some content about the sourcing and what i do in my business and then nick's going to go through some deal analysis and show you some live calculations which is really really good i've seen sort of a bit of an insight into it um, and then we're going to just bang straight into the q a at the end so hopefully that's okay for everybody um this webinar, I guess Nick and I have very similar opinions about the big sales pitchy webinars that exist. Um, we, I, we both like to just put everyone's mind at rest. There is nothing to sell you at the end of this. This is very much a content led hour. Um, it's about giving back to the community that's created the success that we have in our own lives now. And it's about trying to help other people who are hitting barriers and have got questions and just not quite getting whatever it is they need helping you guys to just do a little bit different or do a little bit better or push a little bit further. Um, and that's literally it. So please all rest assured, there's none of that come in at the end. Um, literally the live Q and A will be the last bit and then we will hopefully give you as much as we can. So um, let's get into this bit, just a bit of a background about me. Uh, I'm, for those of you that are have not heard me speak before or not met me or whatever it is, I'm from a sales and marketing background. I've been in sales my whole life. My first job was in a retail store selling sports stuff in JD Sports. Um, when I came out of university, I sold warehouse racking and suspended ceilings, much like what you can see in this office here. Um, and I moved into recruitment. So I spent most of my for um, delivering a good customer focused consultative sales process and I think that's done me quite well for the property sector. Um, I started in property in 2015 so I don't know if anyone can relate to that but I'm actually reasonably new. I'm only probably 18 to 20 months ahead of where some of you definitely are now. Um, I currently run a rent to rent portfolio in Milton Keynes, which is where I started with rent to rent. That was my beginning strategy. Um, I run a national sourcing business, so I source all sorts of deals all over the UK for investors. And uh, I'm best known for rent to rent because it's where I started, but we actually now do everything, including developments. I've literally just put a development offer out today. So um, I'm still learning. Uh, I'm still sharing knowledge and I generally just like to have a lot of fun in my business and make money. They are the two key things that I want to do. Um, and so, yeah, that's a, a whistle stop tour through my background. Now Nick's going to tell us about him. Uh, yeah, first of all, thanks, Sarah, very much for hosting this webinar. Really appreciate it. Uh, you know, putting all the work in, etc. Uh, Welcome. I'm, I'm really lucky. I can just turn up and talk. I haven't got to do any, any work, really. So uh, thank you very much for that. Um, so a bit of background on myself, um, so I joined the Royal Navy when I was 20, um, I did um, like nine years in the submarine service, I was on nuclear submarines, um, I bought my first um, buy to let when I was 20, um, I rented the rooms out because it was by the hospital, 
Um, I made lots of money from it. I thought this is too easy. I must be doing something illegal. So I carried on buying them. Uh, by the time I got to about 25, 26, I was financially free. I stayed in the Navy until I was 28, got some more property behind me. I then left and started Pegasus Property uh, with John Colclough, my business partner, who I met uh, online, actually, through Facebook. Um, so we built this company, Pegasus Property, over the past sort of 20 months. Um, it's, it's, it's been going very well. Uh, we source property, we renovate it, and we let it all in one hit. So we've basically created a opening door for people down south that want to invest in Staffordshire and the Cheshire areas where the yields are better. Um, so that's basically what I do. Um, also, it says on here, Unity Project. So I started a business community called Unity Project about three months ago, um, which is going really well. So that's just monthly meetings with seminars from experts and we have masterminds and all the rest of it. So that's me. Thank you very much, Nick. Guys, just I'm just going to stop it for a second because there's a couple of comments coming through about the sound. Um, Demio runs through Chrome. So if you're having issues with the sound, just double check you've got Chrome and it's running through there and you've switched everything else off. It can be a bit temperamental at times. Mm -hmm. um, just a Demio thing. Sorry about that. Um, can I just have a little comments thing that you can hear me? If you can hear me, just put a quick yes in so that we know that someone's listening. Amazing. So the guys that are coming through, Paul, with, with no sound. Oh, you're not going to be able to hear me say your name, actually. Um, let me type it in the box. Switch off and switch back on. Technology. I know, right? It proves it's live, though, I, I guess. <laughs> great, but it's also shit at the same time. So. At the same time. So, guys, um, I can see a couple of questions coming in now. I'm going to leave the questions till the end, but one just really easy one for me to answer. He said, did I say I was based in Luton? No, I'm based in Milton Keynes, but I work in Luton. I do work in Luton. So hopefully that answers that question. So I'm going to run through these key things tonight, and it's going to be a bit of a whirlwind through them because actually I don't want to just bore you to tears with slides. Um, I'll answer any questions afterwards. So we're going to just quickly run through compliance when running a sourcing and packaging business. Can I, just do, can I just do a quick uh, one-minute thingy, sorry, about this webinar? Yeah, yeah. All right. Yeah. So, um, look, you know, me, like... I don't buy into a lot of the guru bullshit. Um, you know, I want to do webinars with people like Sarah. I did one with Julie Maurice the other week. I want them to be content based. I don't want to. I don't want to be selling shit to people. Um, you know, what I mean, I don't want to. I don't want to be doing all that crap. So, me and Sarah basically want to give a super uh, content filled webinar, and we literally like to me being able to source a property, being able to stack a deal, and being able to. Um, sell the deal either to an investor or for yourself or whatever you want to do with it is like super super important as a property developer as a property investor this is like the basic um, not basic but this is like the shit where you need you need to know what you're doing you need an to source everyone wants an to source property you hear all this bullshit like I can source 20 deals a month and I'll make millions you know maybe maybe not but hopefully me and Sarah between us you know Sarah's going to focus more on um, sourcing because that's the that's their expertise. I'm going to focus more on deal analyzing and um, how to present the deal as a package to somebody to sell. So hopefully us two combined from this webinar, you're going to learn a shitload tonight. And um, um, hopefully it's going to be really useful for you guys to go away and build your, you know, build your businesses up into uh, a big empire. So, yeah, yeah. I'd like to just add to that. Sourcing is whether you like it or not, whether they like it or not, the entry point to every single property strategy that exists. Mm -hmm. I don't care if you're doing developments. I don't care if you're doing, you know, projects with GDV of 100 million or whether you're doing one single rent to rent that gives you a thousand pound a month. I don't care any of those. You as a sourcer, you learning how to source, whether it's for you to keep or whether it's for you to sell, ultimately the sourcing bit is the most important part because without it, nothing else happens. So, okay. You either need to get to a point where you're good at sourcing yourself or you end up you need to partner with people that are good at sourcing like Nick and I who will be able to show you the way, if that makes sense, so that you can it's really... It's not that as well, is it? It's actually when a sourcer comes to you with a deal or you find a deal, you need to know. You need to know if it's good or not. Yeah, and how do you know that if you if you don't know how to stack a deal or you don't, you know, so that's what I'm going to cover, but I'll, I'll, I'll shut up for a bit. <laughs> I got one sent to me literally a couple of weeks ago and um, the post, it was from Facebook and the post said that I would be making £850 a month profit. I was like, brilliant, let's have a look at that. Once it went through my calculations, which I'm going to run through in a minute, it made like a £300 a month loss. 
And there's sadly a lot of people out there that haven't got those calculators, haven't got that scientific way of stacking the deal yet, who are getting caught out by buying these sorts of deals from other sources who are not doing it properly. So, yeah, you're so right, Nick. It's important about being able to assess what's coming to you as well as trying to, what you try to find as well. So I'm going to run through the compliance, how you should be compliant, but also if you're buying deals from in sources, how to check that they're compliant so that you're protected and your, ultimately your money is protected. How to I got started and how you can kind of replicate that. Um, the difference between landlords and agents and how I feel about it and what maybe it would be good to get Nick's input on that because um, different types of deals that we source and so there might be a difference of opinion um, and different places you can look, different places that I make money from and then we'll do a quick financial analysis structure for rent to rent, which is I'm doing rent to rent because Nick's going to focus on the more purchase and renovation type deals. So the first thing is compliance. Now, can I just have a little comment in the box if you are someone who is going to be a sourcer or be buying from a sourcer? Can I just have a little uh, tap? Be a sourcer, buy in. Someone's asking if this is being recorded and someone says, is it just me? I can't hear Sarah, but I can hear Nick. Um, can everyone else hear me? Okay, so we've got lots of people buying deals. Um, lots of people buying. Okay, so a lot of you actually are buying. So let me just kind of tailor this. I'll cover both sides. But let me tailor it first for the guys that are going to be buying from a saucer. Now, when you start working with a saucer, as an investor buying a deal, there's actually some steps that they should be taking you on to make sure that you are a legitimate source of funds. So a sourcer is defined in law as the same as an, an, an agent. And what that means is we have to adhere to the same rules as an agent. Now, anti-money laundering is probably top of the tree. It's run by HMRC. If you are not registered for anti-money laundering, they will fine you. And I know this to be the case because before I started, or when I first started, I didn't really know what I didn't know. I set up this business and then there was a period of about six weeks where I wasn't registered. And then I got registered and they'd seen that my accounts were started here and that I started registering here and they fined me for six weeks until I actually went back and sort of argued and they did let me off in the end, but they tried to fine me. It genuinely does happen. HMRC expects sources to be registered. What that means is they're given a code of conduct to follow. So you as a buyer, you should be offering up information on your, um, you know, things like your ID, your um, proof of funds, where that those funds have come from, you know, what is the legitimate source of those sorts of things, um, making sure that the... Um, you've had photo ID and all of that sort of stuff. So what's going to happen is that when you work with a sourcer, if they're not asking you for those things, it's probably because they're not working in a compliant way. And the risk to you of working in that way is that your money's at risk. So they could be, if they're not working in a compliant way, they probably don't have the right insurance. They probably aren't selling you something that's structured well because they haven't clearly worked hard enough to figure out how to even run the business yet. So you need to protect yourselves, really. Data protection is another one. So if you're going to give your ID over to a source, so they should be able to give you what their um, information commissioner's office data protection membership number is. So again, don't just go and send all your personal information out into the internet without any really understanding of where it's going. Just ask to see what their ICO number is if they don't know what that is, maybe don't work with them. That is my advice on that one. Freshman yeah. indemnity insurance, again, the same thing. Ask to just see a copy of their cover. If they've got it, which they should have, then great, go and work with them. And the same for the property ombudsman. You need to have one of the redress schemes as a sourcer. So that could be the property ombudsman, it could be ombudsman services, or it could be the property redress scheme. There's three. But to be compliant and to be operating in a compliant way, they have to legally be one of them. So you can ask just to ask for their membership number. And if a sourcer says to you as a buyer, I don't know what that is, again, I'd suggest probably don't work with them. Um, yeah, you might pay a little bit more for a sourcer that's being running compliant because they've had they've got more overheads to run their business. But I guarantee that your um, the deals will be positioned better. They'll be likely to be more legitimate and you're not going to be ripped off, generally, is how I feel about it. What are your thoughts on that, Nick, just quickly? Yeah, so, I mean, when um, when I actually stack my deals and deal package them, which I'm going to show you later, 
um, I actually put all my insurance documents into the folder that I send the client. So it's like I'm being super upfront and proactive with people by going, here's my RCO, here's my property number to a number, uh, here's my company registration number so you can search me on a company's house. Um, and uh, here's my insurances all in a folder for you. So it's just being really upfront, looks more pro as well. Yeah. Um, totally. Yeah. And as a sourcer, if there's anyone on here that's sourcing to sell deals, it allows you to charge a little bit more money because you're at the top of, you know, you're at the top of the industry. Unfortunately, in our industry, there are not very many people that are sourcing in a compliant way, which is why most of the deals that you see online are shit. Um, you know, I'm one of the only there's there's two sources in the country that are allowed to train under the property mark band of Arla. I'm one of those trainers. And that's because the other one and I, Tina Walsh is the other one. Um, we do things at such a standard that it's considered to be acceptable under Arla, which means you should be kind of trying to push to the top of your game. Being compliant is not a difficult thing to do. It doesn't cost that much money. Um, and all the questions that I've had about costs and stuff, I'll cover right at the end. Um, guys, just do it. And if you're buying deals, definitely ask to see your sources information. Mm -hmm. um, the way I started my business, so and the way you can start your business, honestly, guys, it's not something that should be too difficult. All the lights have just gone off above my head, but never mind. Um, all you need is a good understanding of your audience. Okay, so depending on the types of deals that you're sourcing, whether it's rent to rent, whether it's um, HMOs, whether it's BMVs, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, whether you're sourcing to sell it or sourcing to keep it, you just need to understand who you're working for and work, who you're working with. The reason that someone wants to give you their house on a rent to rent basis is because they've got a problem. So as a sourcer, it's really important that you just go in thinking about how can I fix their problem. What is their problem? Find out what their problem is and structure a deal that solves that problem for them so for example if it's a purchase deal and they're in debt and they need to you know or they need to move or something like that then what you need to really think about is okay well, what deal can i structure that actually fixes that issue with rent to rent it might be they're dealing with voids or they're dealing with bad tenants or a letting agent that's just taking the piss in terms of their letting fee you know whatever their problem is how can you structure a deal that works to fix that problem when you work out who your audience are, you work out how you can help them, that's when you'll be paid because being paid as a sourcer is a consequence of doing a good job on behalf of your buyer and your your client that you're fixing the problem for, your homeowner, whatever you want to call them. If you're keeping the deal, obviously, then you kind of take the investor hat. Again, just structure a deal that helps them. That's it. That's all you have to do. That's the best way of finding many, many deals is to just be human about it and, th and think, how can I help this person out of this position? Because there's always a solution. It's just about structuring it in the right way. Um, I would also recommend that when you start this, that you pick either one or a couple of key strategies that you want to focus on, because otherwise you end up running around with all different, you're trying to do a development appraisal, you're trying to do a rent-to-rent -rent appraisal, you're trying to do HMO, trying to do a BMV, you're also trying to figure out how to do lease options because you haven't quite nailed that yet. You also want to do rent-to-own and instalment contracts and everything like that, and actually your brain will expose. It happened to me, trust me when I tell you, I was going to do everything, I was going to do all of the strategies straight away. I soon very quickly learned I needed to perfect one, then get that running, and then start working on the other, get that running, and so on and so forth. Now, actually, my business does do everything, but we are we, we've systemized each type to make sure that actually we're doing a good job for everybody all the way through. But I would definitely recommend you start with maybe one or two. Um, you need a phone, you need an internet connection, and that's about it, really. There's really no need to start with big money. So um, this is something Nick and I were talking about earlier. When I first started my business, I had 50 grand's worth of debt. And I'm not going to go into a big sob story. There is no sob story. I just spent too much money on booze, actually, and I'm going out. And I just more, spent more than I had. What that meant for me was I didn't have the cash to spend the money on going and having flyers done and going and paying leaflet droppers to distribute things. And I didn't have the money to go on big training and all of that sort of stuff. So actually, I just picked up the phone, I went to the internet and found as much free stuff as I could. And I used that to create my little marketing and sales plan. I had an online strategy and then I worked really fucking hard 
And that's it. That's all I did is I relentlessly hit the phones and relentlessly made the calls and relentlessly sent the messages out. And that's how I got started. You don't need to have loads of money. That's something I really wanted to reassure everyone on here because I know there's people that have asked me on Facebook about this session. You know, how did you get started? How much did you need? What did you spend to get started? Literally nothing. I spent about £300 in the first year on marketing stuff because I just didn't have it to spend. So I wanted to make sure that you guys knew that. Um, landlords versus agents. So um, my favourite is landlords because I started with landlords. The problem with landlords is that you only maybe get one or two houses from them. They don't typically have lots of stock because they're, they're, it's their own investments. Sometimes you get lucky and you end up with an investor that's got a big portfolio, um, but it's rare. The great thing about landlords is though you go direct to them, they make the decision, they have the, they have the decision to make and you can go and give them the solution to their problem and hopefully fix it. Um, all you need to do is structure that solution for them. Generally, they're advertising online for you to actually call them. Their house is for sale or their house is for rent. That's an advert, that's an invitation for them to call you. What you don't need to do is be worried that you're cold calling people because you're not really, you're warm calling people. Um, your job when you're sourcing, whether you're sourcing to keep or sell, is to save them time and save them money. Once you've done that, then brilliant. The great thing though about agents in comparison to a landlord is whilst it's more difficult to get to the landlord because you have to go via the agent, um, agents have a lot more stock. So once you've got an agent on board and they like you and they're working with you and you've built good rapport, you've educated them in terms of what you're looking for, how the numbers work and all that sort of stuff, actually they bring you deal after deal after deal after deal. And I don't know what, um, Nick, what your experience is of that, but I now am in a position where agents call me, I don't really call them. That when something comes on, they phone me and say, do you want it before we send it out to just the general public because we need to move quickly or we need this. Is that something you experience up where you are? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'll give some feedback. Yeah, um, so, can you turn your microphone off a sec, Sarah? Yeah. Cheers. That's better. Yeah, cool. So, um, yeah, um, basically, yeah, we do we do the fire dropping, we do um, bandit boards, we do all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, when you when you do a lot of viewings on properties, it's the same agents over and over and over. So in the beginning, it's like it's, it's hard at first because they don't know you and that you haven't proven yourself yet. But you know, after like two years of doing it now they're calling me because they know that if they give me a deal that ticks my boxes, I will buy it. And that assurance that they get that I'm definitely going to buy it means they call me first. When you mess them around and you put offers in and you don't go through, do you know what I mean? You get, you get, you get blacklisted then and then you don't get any phone calls and you're known as just being a time waster. So you've just got to be really careful not to, not to time waste. Um, I can't be heard apparently. Um, you, you can unmute yourself now, Sarah. <laughs> I totally agree with you on that. Don't waste agents' time. They um, they don't like it. And actually, if you put an offer in, uh, even whether it's a landlord or an agent, if they accept it, make sure you can deliver on it. Otherwise, you will never get them back. It is the most frustrating thing in the world when you, for whatever reason, have had to let them down. You know, you have to put yourself in their shoes. There's a million other people who are doing what we do. Well, maybe not a million, that's probably a bit strong, but there's a lot of other people doing what we do. So what's important is that you distinguish yourself is that you actually deliver on what everything you say you're gonna deliver on is really, really important. Also never ever try and cut your agent out of the loop, whether it's a rent to rent, whether it's a purchase or whatever. You may end up dealing direct with the owner, but always, always, always keep them paid and keep them in the loop because agents talk to each other. And if you happen to be one of those people who cuts them out of the loop, feel they feel like they've been ripped off, I guarantee your name will be blacklisted in every agent in the area. I've seen it happen. Um, and it's, it will be painful to you and your pipeline. So yeah, don't do that. Be fair and ethical in your business. Do what, treat people how you would like to be treated. That's generally the rule and you'll be okay. Okay, so three places that I found deals and I continue to find deals, Gumtree open rent, newspaper adverts. And when I talk about newspaper adverts, I mean classified newspaper ads. Um, right move, just pick up the phone, call the agents, the advertising. 
networking event i've put almost free because you have to pay 10 quid for your breakfast usually but very cheap low budget um there's a there's a very nice feeling when you walk into a non-property networking event because you could often feel like you're the most educated person in property in the room when you go to property networking events sometimes even i feel intimidated sometimes when i walk into those rooms and it's full of people that have got like 30 years experience i think jesus these people all know way more about this than i do so instead ooh, my lights will come back on now um instead i go to non-property networking events where actually i know more than most of those people in the room and property networking events is all your competitors in the room at non-property networking events it's all your customers in the room so my thoughts on property networking are it's great if you want to learn but you're unlikely to find customers in the room because there's so many competitors in that room it'd be really hard whereas when you go to non-property networking it's business owners it's um, solicitors accountants dentists you know professional services all of those sorts of people who've got money generally and usually are landlords or no landlords or are married to a landlord or something like that um friends and family i would i tell everybody what i do now i think most of you have seen me on facebook i guess and i'm sure that's where many of, in fact i'd be interested to know where you all saw about this webinar tonight whether it's facebook or email or whatever that'd be helpful in the comments box for future reference um untold auction lots places like uh, auctionhouse.co.uk you can actually access the um direct to vendor not through the auction house but you can get the um, owner's name and address from the internet so you can send them a letter direct and places like the gazette where you can find probate deals via executives of wills and things like that there's loads and loads and loads of free places on the internet so if you like i was if you can relate at all to being either in debt or struggling financially and not really having the money to go and blast on marketing then i'd recommend you start in these places because they cost nothing um okay so how to stack a rent to rent deal and then i'm going to hand over to nick to show you how to stack his deals um one of my biggest frustrations with rent to rent is that i see deals all the time online where it says gross rental income minus rent equals profit that is not the case that is not how it works okay you have operational costs of running that business so Gross rental income, that is the rent you get from your tenants when they live in the house. They pay you rent, that's your gross rental income. What you have to do is take out utilities. We factor in £65 per person per month, which covers gas, electric, TV license. Council tax, you can go to a website that's uh, mycouncilltax.org.uk. That will give you the exact council tax figure to be able to go away and put that number into your calculator. Maintenance we and repairs, we do it £20 per month per person every month clean it obviously because you're going to clean it that's part of the service you're offering as a rent to renter uh, broadband because everyone needs internet these days your insurance will be a minimum of 25 pounds uh, for public liability insurance everyone should have that in their um, business if you're running rent to rent voids you need to put a void buffer into every house because it will not be full all the time um, we do gross rent divided by 12 by assuming that at least um, every room will be empty at least once in that annual period and then you profit at hundred pounds per person per month like per room per month gives you the maximum rent that you can pay to the landlord now what I'm going to do is I'm going to email out um, a sample rent to rent brochure so that you can see it and I know Nick's going to email out some bits as well um, after this session but that is basically how to stack a rent to rent deal and I'll answer any questions on it afterwards in fact shall I answer questions now on this Nick before we jump into yours yeah yeah is there any questions on how to stack this or what that what you're looking at on screen or anything else I've said let's have a little look um, I can see you've answered a lot of these questions actually Nick which is good <laughs> I will I will move on to you and I will just keep an eye on the questions so um let me make you I'm gonna hand over to Nick now guys so um, let me just make Nick the presenter Should... Is that working uh, says Nick is presenting cool and then if you um can you share your screen uh... I think it's not there now. 
So I'm going to request to be a presenter. Yes, request. You are now presenter. Uh, Working? Well, earlier, earlier there was a little tab and I could click on yeah, it to do it. Refresh really quickly and I think it'll fix it. Scary. I'm all on my own now. <laughs> Hit refresh, Nick, at the top of your um, Chrome, Chrome, Chrome page <coughs> okay. for me, please. Hey, guys. Sorry. Minor technical glitch. I normally have Jason West help. Okay, I'm with back. It. Aha. Okay. So um, let me make you the presenter. Yeah. Got it? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. So you should be able to share it now. I can't hear you though for some reason. Uh, okay. Right. Cool. I'm in. So, thanks, Sarah, for all that cool information. That was great. Um, I'm basically just going to go through a deal analyzer now. So. This is a spreadsheet that I created basically to help me analyze deals. So when I first started sourcing property way back when, um, you know, I used to get all my numbers and I used to scribble on a notepad. And, um, you know, if, if, if I was, if I was lucky, then it stacked and it used to take quite a while and I'd take a calculator around with me and all sorts. So, um, I thought there must be an easier way of doing this. So I created the spreadsheet. So this is actually a HMO deal analyzer. Uh, the kind of difference between this one and my other deal analyzers is that I've got um, multiple room incomes. I've got all the all the bills there, things like that. I've got a deal stack. Um, I've got a deal stacker for flipping properties. I've got a deal stacker for new builds, commercial to residential, buy to let, etc. So uh, at, at the end of this webinar, um, Sarah is actually going to give me all of the email addresses, which means I'm going to add you to my database. So that means you're going to get spammed with my marketing material. Um, so if you don't want it, just unsubscribe and say fuck off and I won't be bothered, honestly. Um, but if you do subscribe, then you will get these deal analyzers. Um, so I'm going to start off at the top then. So you first of all, um, I don't want to spend too long on this because, you know, end of the day, you know, you can play around with it yourself. But ultimately, you put your purchase price in, you put your sourcing fee in, legal costs, that's like uh, searches, conveyancing costs. Uh, you've got this bridging bit here, so if you use a bridge, you can put that in there. You put your stamp duty in. I'll put calculate yourself. So you just calculate yourself by going on stampdutycalculator.com or whatever it's called. You can put your HMO license in there. So there's some sort of initial costs for you. Um, down here, you've got your conversion costs. So um, I actually have a way of, of calculating conversion costs. So I get the total floor space of a building. And I can get that either by measuring it myself using a laser measurer, which you can buy for about 60 quid from Screwfix. Um, and I'll just do the perimeter of the building and I'll, I'll work out what the total floor space is. Um, or if you go on the EPC register, if you Google EPC register online, it will come up on Google. You just click on there and um, you can basically put a postcode in for any property in the UK. And it'll come up with all the all the street names uh, and uh, house numbers. And if there's been one done in the last couple of years, which there probably has, it would be on there. If you go on there and open that as a PDF, um, it'll actually tell you the, the total floor space of that building. So if you get the total floor space of a building and you times it by, for, for, like, a, for like a flip or a buy to let, I'll times the total floor space by about 200, 200 pound per square meter. Um, if I get a four or five bedroom HMO with a couple of bathrooms, I use about 350 pound a square meter. Um, if I do a, all on suite six bed HMO, I use about 450 pound a square meter. If I'm doing flats, like a commercial to residential conversion into flats, like an office into flats, I use 650 per square meter. And if I'm doing a commercial to residential conversion with all the trimming, soundproofing, insulation upgrades, et cetera, et cetera, um, then I'd use about 750 pound a square meter. So these are rough things that I use, and that's how I work out what the conversion cost is gonna be on a, a development opportunity. So I put that in there. Obviously, you can get your builder to come along and do it for you as well. Problem is, if you're sourcing a lot, a lot of property, the way I do it is, is I, I get deals come across my desk all the time. So I stack them in here in about two minutes. And then if the ROIs and the yields are bang on and they're, and they're what I want, then 
I will then go and look at the property. Typically, I'd bring my builder with me at this point, so I know it's probably going to be a goer. I've pretty much worked out from my desktop if it's going to be a good deal or not. At this point, I would take my builder and he would do a proper quote for me and he'd notice any structural things that I might miss. However, when I first started out, I didn't know what was a good deal and what wasn't a good deal. So I was dragging my builder along with me to everybody viewing and he got pissed off pretty quickly, as you can imagine. So, um, you know, that's a good way of pissing off builders if you do that. So I wouldn't recommend it. So if you can work out roughly yourself what the conversion cost is going to be, that's quite a powerful bit of knowledge to have. Uh, you can probably see in here, I've put some things like electrics, three and a half grand, heating, five grand, kitchen, two and a half grand, bathroom, 1,000, sitting room, 500. Loft conversions are typically between 20 and 25K for a loft conversion. I mean, these are all numbers that I use for Stoke-on-Trent where I am. If you're based in London, it's probably going to be higher. If you're based further north, it might be cheaper. So it's kind of for you to work out, to be honest with you. And you get that from experience. I'm just going to go back and make sure I'm still, I'm still here. Can everyone see me okay? I'm just in, yeah, cool, right, back to it. So, so you put your uh, refurb cost in there. Um, furniture, so I'll show you this afterwards. I'm gonna go into deal packaging afterwards. So um, with furniture, I've got another spreadsheet that I use and I can put in like six rooms, uh, six bathrooms, one lounge, blah, blah, blah. And it spits out a approximate furnishing and dressing estimate for me. So I bang that in there. Project management, so if I if I manage a project for somebody else, I charge 10% of the building cost to project manage it. However, you know, if you're if you're um, doing investment from afar in another area, they the person doing the renovation might charge you a project management fee, so you can stick that in there as well. So it gives you this total initial cost of uh, 211,000 pounds. So this is a real deal that I'm actually sourcing currently. So I found this deal, Direct Defender, a couple of days ago, and um, I'm, you know, Basically, I've, I've stacked it. So the, these are real numbers for a real deal. So if you go up to here to initial purchase capital required, this is like, you know, if you're putting 25% down, you've got your professional fees. So that's all your finders fees, sourcing fees, legal fees added up. Project management fee goes in there. Uh, building costs. So that's going to be your build and your furniture added together. So that's kind of what you're looking at, 128K. So if you weren't buying this building uh, cash or outright with 100% finance, you know, with 100% of your own money and you were going to use financing, that's potentially what you could be looking at. Also, you could be using a bridge for the building costs. So you could be doing uh, 25, 30% of that 86,000 pound cost as well. So that gives you a quick idea of what the capital uh, is required to do a deal like this. So that's a refinance model. We'll come back to that in a sec. I'm just gonna come down here to income and expenses per month. So like I said, this is the HMO deal sucker. So I've got room rentals one through seven. So they're different levels of room rental, starting off at 350, going up to 550 per room. So in Stoke-on-Trent, 350 is like my bottom, my bottom rent, really. 550 is kind of my top rent. So I just put in the number of rooms that there is. This is a six bed, all on suite HMO. So I've put four rooms at 425, two rooms at 450. So that adds that all up into a gross rental income per month of 2,600. I minus 5% off of voids, which is 130 quid. So that just gives a true reflection, really, of what I think the rental income is going to be. Coming down, so you've got this little um, mortgage calculator. So, you know, maybe if you've bought it with some sort of lending or it's got a buy-to-let running on it and you're doing a renovation or whatever, you can stick that in there and it'll work out the interest for you. Um, so I'm doing this based on someone buying it with cash or whatever. Uh, running costs, so, you know, 90 quid for council tax, 60 quid for heating, 60 quid for electricity, 35 pounds for water, 50 quid for internet, 12 pound 50 for TV license, uh, put some in there for pat testing, fire eggs, building insurance, 25 quid, cleaner, 12 pound a week. Uh, our properties come with cleaners, so that's 48 quid a month. So that adds all of that up for you for your outgoings, your bills. Management at 12%, 296 pound 40. <clears throat> and then it gives you your total expenditure. So that minus the gross rental income gives you that sum. So your monthly cash flow will be just shy of 1,800 pounds, which per year is 21 and a half thousand pounds. So it gives you this initial ROI and this initial gross yield in net yield with a payback time, etc. So that's assuming you've found a deal and you're just gonna put all cash in and you're not gonna refinance it. Now, <coughs> most property developers I know will refinance because that's kind of what we do, right? So this is where you come up to the refinance model. So I've based this one on 7.5 times the gross rental income per annum. So I know that if you get a commercial uh, mortgage on this, 
Typically around Stoke-on-Trent, they take the gross rental income, the gross rental income per annum, they times it by 7.5, um, which gives you that amount. So that's kind of the GDP when you're refinancing. It's just an estimate. Nobody knows the true answer. If everyone knew the true answer of the GDP, we would all be millionaires tomorrow because that's the gamble with property development is what's it going to be worth when you're finished. We're all just taking educated guesses. So I put two, three, four. <coughs> so if you were doing 75% LTV on that, that's what that's going to give you. It gives you the capital left in the deal. It tells you how much capital you release. You put your new mortgage in, 4.6, 5%, whatever you want to put in, you bang that in there. And it gives you a new um, cash flow with a new per annum, with a new ROI and gross yield and net yield. So these are the numbers I'm using when I'm sourcing a deal up for a client. I'm basing my ROIs on um, when you've refinanced it. I'm basing my yields on when you've refinanced it. I'm telling them how much money they've left in. They're the key things they want to know. How much is it going to cost me? How much money am I leaving in? And when I've left my money in, what am I making? So I'm saying, well, you're going to make a grand a month easily and you're only leaving 35K your money tied up. So that's pretty good. Your payback time is 33 months. Um, so, you know, um, just, just under three years, basically. So that's my deal analyzer. So everyone's going to receive a copy of that. And also it comes with a YouTube video of me explaining how to use it. Um, so hopefully that'll be of use for you. Um, I'm just going to go back and make sure that everyone can uh, still hear me. Can you still hear me? Just put a quick thingy. Right, cool. Well, I'm just going to carry on for five more minutes then, if that's all right. I want to talk about polishing numbers. So deal sources get a bit of a bad rep. Reason is, is that a lot of people go on to right move, they find something on right move, they stack it like this, and then they put these numbers on and they put like 50 grand renovation and they put like it's, it's below market value and it's all bollocks like because at the end of the day, they're polishing the numbers to make it look better. So I've agreed this at 110K. Houses around there sell for 120 to 130,000. So it is a little bit BMV, but I'm not going to advertise the fact. I'm just going to, so I don't believe in BMV. I believe in you pay what it's worth, you know, you pay what it's worth basically. Um, so it is direct defender. So I'm charging 3%, which is for some people quite high, but I think it's direct defender. It's a good deal. Um, you know, I will change that sourcing fee depending on how much meat is in the deal for my client. So if it's a shit deal, I'm not going to charge much sourcing fee. It's got to be a bit of give and take, you know, um, legal cost, thousand pound. Stamp duty, they're basically kind of fixed costs. Some people do spend more than a thousand pounds on legals, but you know, the main ones really are like the building cost, the rental income. So I could probably get more like 450 for all these rooms. In which case, if I, if I put six rooms in there and delete that four, oh look, the ROI just banged up to 38% now. But that's me polishing numbers now. I might not get 450 a room. I'm not sure I would get that. So I'm just going to put two in there and four in there. And that's, that's, that's me being conservative, basically. It's all about being conservative. You've got to use worst case scenarios. It's very easy to sit here with a spreadsheet and polish the numbers and make the ROIs and the yields look better. And if you're not careful, if you do that and you lie to yourself, basically, you lie to yourself into thinking that it's a good deal it's, 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 and everything's got to go perfectly smooth and you're going to get the highest rents in the area and the refurb's not going to run over budget. It's not going to run over time. And it, in, that, in those circumstances, it's a good deal. It's not a good deal. Don't do it. <laughs> Basically, you've got to stress test it. You've got to stress test it. And if you're sourcing properties out to clients as well, you've got to stress test it for them. Because if you don't and they come back to you and say, hey, you said I'd get 495 per room and I've only got 425, um, you look shit and you will get bad mouth and you will be ruined very quickly. Uh, it might take them a little time to catch up with you because by the time you sourced it and they've renovated it, you know, it's been a while, but it will come back to you eventually. Bills, again, some of this is fixed. TV license is basically fixed. Council tax is pretty much fixed. Things like heat and electricity, those can be variable. Water's pretty much fixed, unless you've got a meter. Um, you know, so you need to not polish those too much. Um, but yeah, that's it really. And the GDV as well, again, you could really polish that if you want to. You can put in any number you want. You can just make it up. Um, you've got to be super careful not to do that because if the client doesn't get the GDV they are expecting, they're going to come back to you again. Um, you know, and this is something that has made my company um, successful is that we, we actually source properties, but we renovate them as well and we let them all in one hit. So we do the full package. That means I've got accountability. So if I source somebody a deal, I've got to make sure the numbers are correct. Uh, I've got to make sure the renovation is correct on budget, on time. I've got to make sure I get the rents that I quote I'm going to get because if I don't, I look bad. Now, there is some things like 
uh, unforeseen circumstances, the markets can change. So I can't be held too accountable for my actions. But you know, um, you know, you can get you can get caught with your pants your pants down basically if you try and polish your numbers too much. A lot of sources, the reason they get a bad rep is because they only source, they don't have any accountability afterwards. So they can just make it up. They can just make up the numbers, sell it to some poor sod who doesn't know anything any better, and um, and then they're left with a shit deal basically. And that goes on all the time. So um, you know, your deals might not be the best looking, but those people out there who are savvy and know what they're doing, they will see your numbers and they will know that they're real numbers. They see the, the bad sources a mile off, and the bad sources only prey on the weak people. Um, and then they fuck them over. They don't get any repeat business. I get lots of repeat business off my clients because, yeah, my deals aren't the best looking on the market because I'm using real numbers and I'm not polishing it. So that's it from me for the minute. Um, I seem to be on my own at the minute. No, you're here. Sarah's rejoining. Hello. Hi. You okay? Yeah, was that cool? Did, um, yeah, was really, that really okay? I'm learning things, which is always good as well. Um, I think I've still got to do my little packaging thing, but um, I just wanted to come back and make sure that everyone could hear okay. Uh, There's questions, but we can we can um, do those in, the, I think, show the brochure now and how that evolves from one to the other. I think that'd be really, really cool. Yeah, cool. Um, dear, I can see your questions, mate. I will come back to you. Um, I want to do question, uh, answers at the end, if that's okay, because I'm just in a, I'm on my flow at the minute. So um, I'm going to do another screen share. This time, I'm going to do uh, deal packaging. So that was that was deal analyzing. That was using a spreadsheet, which you're going to get a copy of. Um, and and basically, that's really important. You've got to know how to stack a deal. You've got to be able to do it quickly. Doing it quickly is very important because. If it's if it's a deal that's out there online and lots of other people are looking at it, you know, you need to be the first one to see it, the first one to stack it. You need to basically decide that you're already going to be buying it before you've even seen it. Um, you know, and when you get that buzz like this is a good deal, I want this deal, you go along and you're basically there as a formality, make sure it's not falling down, etc. So right, I'll go back to screen share now and then I'm gonna do um stop screen sharing. I'm going to do um, deal packaging. You are sharing your screen, so everyone should be able to see my screen now, hopefully. So this is a folder on Dropbox. Now, on Dropbox, I have all of my deals. And this is like my shop front, basically. So I've got two lists. One list is uh, people that subscribe to my website through my pop-up, or they've downloaded one of my deal analyzers and I've caught them into my funnel and those guys access my shop front which is this now I have a verified list now because of FCA regulations and all the rest of it um, I get people to show me proof of funds which is a way of filtering out time wasters um, I get people to fill in an application form it's not an application form they're not applying for anything it's just it's me gathering information on the, on like Intel on them so it tells me things like their experience how much money they've got uh, it allows me to gauge what they're after, what ROIs they want, what yields they want. Those people get access to a different set of deals. So these deals you're seeing now, this is just like my shop front, basically. So everyone can see my deals. They go out on my mailing list and anyone can come on here and they can they can click through any of my folders and they can look at, uh, they can look at my deals. So this is how I package them. So basically, I've got um my insurance documents in there which i spoke about earlier so you can see my insurance policy and insurance schedules so that's kind of like you know being upfront with people i do a folder called location photos so with this for example i do um you know a picture of the front of the property i do a little red outline on it so people can clearly see what it is i go on google maps and i do like a 3d satellite view and i just draw around it again uh, back shot so you can see what the back of it looks like so as you can see this is just a Victorian era end terrace property it's massive inside um, so I do that uh, I do sorry I keep going um, I also do sorry so I also do like basically where it's located seven minute bike ride to the city center so it's kind of like a little bit of um, I'm backing up my deal with some evidence really like yeah this is a good property this is a good area it's a 30 minute bike ride uh, to Festival Park. The Festival Park is where all the big employers in Stoke on Trent are based. Um, so I do that folder. So that's my locations photo. I have an investor's brochure. So um, I put that in every folder. And that's just like, 
bit bit of uh, you know bit of stuff about Pegasus property really and what we are and what we do and you know it's got some nice photos of our properties on there tells you a bit about Stoke on Trent City of Culture 2021 shortlisted to the top three 79 minutes to Stoke uh, London Euston from Stoke on Trent um, you know that's that's quite a cool little little thing to put in there I've got some case studies of some projects that I've done. So people get an idea. So anyway, you, you get the picture. So it's a nice little investor's brochure in there. It makes us look really pro. I also do some example floor plans. So I make these in um, uh, floorplanner.com. So I basically draw all the outlines. I put all the furniture in, etc. cetera. Um, proposed ground floor. So there's the front door. You come in, stairs go up. Two reception rooms turned into two HMO bedrooms with en suites. This is a big open plan communal space with a big kitchen and a, a settee with a TV on the wall. Um, and I also do 3D rendered versions. So you can do a 3D, you can even walk around it. I actually do a screen recording of me uh, talking whilst I'm um, dragging and dropping around the house and walking around it just to show the client what it looks like. So that's quite a cool little thing. Um, so I do that folder, so that's example floor plans. Um, and then I do this little glossy brochure, which is just like, some pictures, it's a PDF file, it's got some quick glance numbers. So these are off of the um, the deal analyzer. So well sought after HMA, direct defender, uh, asking price 110K, finder's fee, stamp duty, refurbishment, blah, 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 blah. So that all goes in there. So that's like just the, the cover letter really. Um, and this is my uh, furniture and dressing spreadsheet that I mentioned earlier. So I could just stick in the number of rooms, the number of bathrooms, uh, sorry, the number of bedrooms to be dressed, the number of bathrooms, living room costs, uh, 550 for my kitchen bits, uh, 1,000 pound for miscellaneous really, uh, white goods, 1,000 pound, and it bangs out 11 grand. So when I'm, when I'm stacking a deal for furniture, I can just I basically do that spreadsheet and it tells me the furniture cost, which I stick in there. And then of course, this is the spreadsheet that comes with it. So people can see all the numbers analyzed in detail. So that's how I personally package, um, save that. So that's how I personally package my deals. Um, you know, that that bit's just copy and paste, that bit's copy and paste, so it's all the same in every folder. Um, you know, location photos, so I just do them, takes me five minutes. Example floor plans probably takes me about 20 minutes to do from scratch. Um, this deal analyzer takes me about 60 seconds to do. This furniture thing takes me about 30 seconds, and then I just have a template for that in a Word document. I just change the pictures and the text, and that's how that's how I present my deals to my clients. And um, you know, it works. So I'll stop screen sharing now. Right. So hey. I hope that was cool for everybody. <laughs> so I'm going to steal back the. Slides now. I'm going to try to. Yeah, you're on. You're on. I can see you. Okay, one sec. It's not giving my slides. Two seconds. Let me just refresh. I'm going to disappear. Uh, yeah, Matt, basically, if you've, if you've registered for this webinar, that means that I'm going to get your uh, email address. So I'm going to put you into my database, which means you'll be getting emails off me. So my um, my deals, basically, that I'm sourcing, you, you, will get, you will get to see the shop front. Um, so you will have access to how I package the deals through there. So can everybody hear us? I can hear you and see you. Are we on? Yes. Everyone's Nick, here. are you there? Yeah, I'm here. I can't hear you. Have you turned uh, your mic off? No, no, it's on. <clears throat> this happened last time. Ah, I can hear you, you again now. Yeah. I couldn't hear you, but then after 30 seconds, I could hear you for some reason. Ah, okay, cool, cool, cool. So, guys, we are open for questioning. Fire away. Um, there was a couple of questions that I saw. I'm going to just jump in while people are low, like typing their questions in. Um, one of the questions was, Nick, how do you check demand when you're sourcing? Um, yeah, it's a, I don't know. I mean, it's difficult for me because I, I'm local. I've lived here for a while now. I just know the areas really well. I know it off the back of my hand. I've been doing it for like 10 years. So I know, I know what areas are good. But I guess if I was to try and go into a different area, how would I approach that? Um, you know, I, I, I look for like owner occupier areas. Those are places where I do flips. 
Um, you know, they're the houses where I'm going to buy them. I'm going to do them up and sell them on owner occupier areas. Areas where HMOs work well is kind of self explanatory. Uh, you know, around hospitals, around city centres, town centres, near bus stations, train stations, uh, near any big employers, warehouses, factories, you know, universities. And you've got all these different HMO niches. You've got students, you've got young working professionals. Within young working professionals, you've got multiple niches. You've got blue collar, white collar, executive, whatever. You've got DSS. That's all just HMO. You've got service accommodation. Um, you know, you've got commercial to residential. So you've got all these different strategies and all these different types of property. And not every city or town in the UK will be susceptible to all those different strategies. You know, you've got to go with what what works in your area. You know, if you see a gap in the market, like not a lot of people are doing um, executive or white collar hate professional HMOs in Stoke on Trent. I basically started that myself. I started doing that and made it into a thing. And so I've carved that market out in my uh, that niche out within my own market because I knew it existed, but nobody was doing it. So um, with regards to demand, it's just like, you know, you just got to get out there. Marketing is all about split testing, refining. It's all about putting two flyers out. One's got a yellow background, one's got a red background. The yellow background's got a different phone number to the one with the red background. You've got two phones. Which one rings the most, right? The one with the red background, the one with the yellow background gets binned. And then you Can do, I the do a, little, a little trick on that. Um, yeah. so you don't have to have two phones. I used to put a different person's name on each flyer. So if someone called in and called for Diane, then I knew it came from this this piece of marketing. If yeah. someone called in and called for Andy, then I knew it came from this piece of marketing. That way you only have to have one phone number if you guys don't want to have X separate phones. But what you're saying ultimately about split testing is that split testing is absolutely, that you have to do it, 100% agree with you, Nick. Yeah, I mean, um, I, think, I think a lot of people want to know basically like the nuts and bolts, which is how do you find the deal? How do you source it? How do you get it? That's like the big question is, is you know, I'm happy with what you do once you've got the deal. I know, I know how to analyze it. I know how to package it. I know how to find people to buy it. Um, how do I actually find the fucking deal in the first place? That's like the big question. And I see people asking that. So um, maybe if we could try and answer that with some like practical advice. So flyer dropping is the obvious thing. You drop flyers. Uh, you can spend loads of money doing that, thousands of pounds, dropping flyers, getting them dropped, et cetera, et cetera. Something that I do personally that I found to be quite successful is, um, do you know like a to let board that you put outside a property to let? Well, I do that, but instead of to let, it says under renovation. And then it's got a thing underneath saying, we do HMOs, buy to lets, kitchens, bathrooms, loft conversions, extensions, da, 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 with our phone number. And we get loads of people calling us who are like, Oh, I'm 95 years old. I'm living in this big 20 bedroom Victorian mansion and I ate it. It's run down. It's shit. I'm depressed. I've seen you guys buying a few up on the street. Any chance you can uh, maybe have a look at mine? And we go in and we're not assholes about it. We say, look, this is what we've got to spend on it. This is what we think it's worth. We give you cash. And, um, and, and they sell it to us. And a lot of our direct defender deals that we get, which are below market value, come off our renovation boards. Um, you know, a lot of it's word of mouth because we're a letting agency. We just get a ton of landlords who are ringing us up going, hey, I'm selling that house. Or, um, you know, a good example is I saw somebody a HMO, which cost, I sourced it for three grand. I renovated it for them. My project management fee was about 6K. So I made 9K out of it. I then, they then decided they wanted to sell it. So I then sold it on to somebody else for another sourcing fee. And then, and then I let it ongoing as well. So, when you do multiple things like renovations, lettings, sourcing, all these, you get all these crossover points where people, then you start getting busy and organically you start to grow and people start contacting you with loads of deals. And that's just kind of how it goes, basically. Uh, do you have any tips for sourcing commercial properties? It's direct defender. So I've, I've, yeah. I've, I've scribbled down a load of questions that have come through all the way through, which I've got my head down. Sorry, guys, you're looking at the top of my brain. Um, one of them was about brochures and whether or not you include brochures, um, sorry, include comparables in your brochures. And I, I can give you the answer from my perspective and then Nick can do the same. But from, from my side of things, ultimately, 
I will put into a brochure everything that I would personally want to see to be able to make a decision on that property. Okay, there's absolutely nothing that you should be keeping from the investor, nothing at all. If you know it's in an Article 4 area, you put that in. If you know that it is in um, a high demand area, you put that in. If you know that um, it's in a flood zone, you put that in. If you know Whatever you know about that opportunity, whatever you know about the property, whatever you know about the vendor, whatever you know about the location, you put it all in. So in our brochures, you'll have maps, you'll have um, screenshots of the room rent comparables or the um, for sale comparables to show that it's below market value based on the date that the brochure was um, created. You'll have um, the council tax like screenshot of the council tax website. You'll have everything there is to know. So even if there's things like um, an article format that define, that shows you that it's outside or it's inside, then you put that in there. As you're going through your conversation every single piece of information that you find out about that house it goes in there along with your analysis your financial analysis and all the comparables that go with it everything goes in there there's no as you're literally progressing the deal to the point where you want to either keep it or sell it you see a lot of information on your desktop valuations and you see a lot of if you go to viewings you know i do everything remotely so unlike nick goes to viewings and goes and looks at property i do everything from my uh, office here so if you go to viewings, include the video tour that you've taken, include the photographs that you've taken, include all of that stuff, because it's what adds the value to the investor. It's what they're paying you to do. As a sourcer, you know, they're paying you to do that research so that they don't have to do it, so that it's all there in a packaged deal. That's why it's called packaged. It's there for them to look at and actually go, right, here's all the information. This is what I need. This is what I need to find out. I'll go and double check it all, because it's their responsibility to obviously double check. But your job as the sourcer is to make sure you put all that information in there. And literally all we do is we screenshot everything as we go, put it in a folder on Google Drive and then share it and that's it. What are your thoughts, Nick? Yeah, I think I think being transparent is really important. Um, yeah. do, you're basically doing due diligence for the investor. So that's that's your job. That's, that's what they're paying you for. Now, granted, they'll probably go away and do their own due, due, due diligence anyway, but the point is, is that you're the expert. That's what they're coming to you for. So... If you're not the expert, you need to become the expert. You need to know your areas. You need to know what works. It's, it's basically just about grinding away, I think, like hustling a little bit. It's a little bit of like putting the work in. It's not going to be easy. Sourcing is a great way of making loads of money, starting off with no money. It's one of them strategies in property where you can basically make money with nothing, to start with nothing. And what you're doing is, is you're exchanging your time and experience and expertise in exchange for money. So... You know, it is time consuming. Uh, you do get better and quicker at it the more you do it, um, you know, and it used to take me a couple of hours to package a deal. By the time I packaged it, it was, it was sold or something. So, you know, um, what Sarah's saying there about, you know, putting all the information on there is really important. You don't want to miss anything and then get caught out later on when they come back to you and say, hey, you're supposed to be the expert. Why didn't you tell me this, this and this? <laughs> yeah, and I think what's also important, so... Um you know, we when we calculate something, we use our numbers. I use the numbers that present themselves in the deals that we run in our portfolio. So, for example, when we're doing a development, I know in my portfolio, we would never consider a de development that doesn't give you at least 20% profit. OK, so we take the profit out first. We, we, we calculate it like that. So when I'm looking to package up somebody else. I would always apply the same rules. Now, there might be investors out there that won't look at anything less than 30%. And that's okay. When you're building your relationships with your buyers, you'll understand the criteria that they've got. So it's your job to understand what they need and don't send them deals that don't meet that criteria because that's really frustrating as well. Um, there's another question, Nick, about um, how to secure the agreement with the agent so how to secure the house exclusively with the agent before you've managed to get the buyer what are your thoughts on that before i give my answer on that um i don't know really because i don't i don't actually source a lot of stuff through agents these days i used to but I lost you. Um, so i'll give my answer on that instead. not so much anymore i think my audio might have just disconnected then two secs yes can you hear me okay i can hear you Okay, I'll say that again. So I don't really source off agents much anymore. I'm mainly doing direct to vendor now. So I'm just going directly to the vendor. There's no agent involved. Um, but we never used to, it, it's it's a difficult one. Because if, if you go in and say, look, I'm from a development company. I've got hundreds of clients based in Hong Kong and Dubai that I've got millions of pounds in cash. 
I'm here as their representative. I can tell you now that one of them will buy this deal because it stacks. I know it stacks, blah, blah, blah. Give me exclusivity on it and I will sell it for you. Give me that trust and I won't let you down. You don't really need to sign. Like, I don't think you need to sign paperwork. Uh, that's just my opinion. Uh, so uh, I can see Sarah going, Rrr. but you know, I, 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 I agree with you. Okay. Well, I, I like to do things with handshakes, relationship building, trust. That's important. Yeah. I think if you go along with a bit of paper going, sign this, mate, they're just like, oh, what the fuck's that? What am I signing? You know, and, and it, it creates like a distrust straight away. So I don't like it personally. I like to do handshakes. Yeah. If it fucks up, it fucks up. It's one of them. There's more deals out there. You know, don't get too caught up on it. You just put them down as this is not someone that I'm going to work with again. And they've just fucked themselves over. So, yeah, you know. I actually 100% agree with you. And I think I'm my reaction to it is that actually it's quite refreshing to hear that opinion because I, I am of the opinion that as soon as you try and get an agent to sign a piece of paper to take it off the market and give it to you exclusively before you've really been able to show them that you've got any kind of commitment from anywhere else. They instantly clam up. They instantly don't want to know. They instantly want to not talk to you anymore. So it's easier just to get it to the point where you say, do you know what? I'm going to, your, the way you protect your deals is by having a robust agreement with your buyer. Okay. It's not about controlling the vendor and controlling the agent. It's about controlling your investors. Okay. Build relationships with your investors. Get them to sign your NDAs. Get them to sign your non circumvention, all of that stuff. That's the bit you do at the beginning when you start to get to know your buyers. That's the bit you need to get them to do at that end. Then when you've got a deal from an agent, so you, you know, you've put your offer in, they've accepted it in principle. You've got a buyer in mind that it's for already. You have heads of terms drawn up. You can have that done. I mean, you can ask them to sign exclusivity agreements, but honestly, I think it kills the deal a lot of the time. Um, the, the way to show that you're into the deal is to get solicitors appointed on both sides. That is the way to show an agent that you're serious is to say, okay, what is the standard process to go through? Well, with any other buyer, the next thing would be to appoint solicitors and start discussing how to progress it. Your job as a sourcer is to coordinate the parties to make sure that that activity happens. And once the agent sees that happen, they'll take it off the market, it'll be done. And that's generally how I feel about it. It's a lot more to do with trust and to do with, um, you know, actually just, being in control of the communication a lot of the time. Don't let it drift. Get back to people. Talk to people. That's that's the main thing. And I think as well, if you're dealing direct with landlords, with vendors, trying to control them and getting them to sign their life away is really hard to do. So, you know, like with rent to rents, for example, I don't ever ask anybody to sign anything or pay me a penny until the contract is signed between the investor and the landlord. Once that's signed, then I'll send my invoice out. So no one signs anything until the deal's completely done and finished, negotiated, agreed, and done. We don't ask them to sign something here and then again here and then again here. People just get freaked out. How do you feel when you're asked to sign something? I don't particularly like it unless I absolutely know what I'm signing. And most of these guys, especially landlords and vendors, they don't understand this creative world that we're in. And so when you start to talk to them about heads of terms and all these things, they don't get it and they disappear. So my advice to you is is to just control the communication and not get those signatures because it kills deals. My thoughts. Um, uh, la, 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 what was the other question that I saw? Someone asked me about um, the costs of gas safety certificates in my rent to rent calculations. The gas safety certificate costs come out of the repairs and maintenance budget that we get every month, which is £20 per room per month. So on a five bed, it's £100 a month. So um, that, that gas safety certificate, which I think is about 50 quid, we pay or 60, something like that here, um, it comes out of that budget. So hopefully that answers the question. I think it was Jermaine that asked me that question. Um, also, the council tax website, I was asked to repeat that. It's my council tax dot org dot uk um, and you just put the postcode in and it brings up the whole street and then it says number one foster's lane or whatever it is um, and you can see the exact figure for that property because obviously every house on the road is different you divide that by 12 and that gives you your monthly expenditure for council tax so hopefully that answers that question i'm actually ticking them all off my box because i've seen um off my book um we've done that one um there was a question about cost for compliance. Do you mind if I take that one, Nick? Yeah, I don't really know the answer off the top of my head. So, so um, anti-money laundering is about £250 to register. 
Um, data protection is £35 as long as you have a business that's got less than 250 employees, which I'm assuming everyone on this webinar has. Um, and your property ombudsman, it depends which one you join. Sorry, property redress scheme, it depends which one you join. I'm a member of the property ombudsman. That is that is the more expensive one, but it's the one that's been around the longest. It's probably the most recognized. And they obviously, they all allow you to use their badge. But when you're talking to vendors and things like that, sometimes the TPO logo is a little bit more credible than the others. But that's just my opinion. Um, you need to go away and research and, and decide what's right for your business. Um, I think it was about 130 quid or something like that. I'm not sure on the exact figure because it changes all the time. Um, and your insurance will be dependent on you. So um, it also depends on whether or not you're going to be keeping properties, in which case you need public liability, or if you're just going to be sourcing to package on, in which case you just need indemnity um, and maybe employer's liability. Uh, but So the costs on that are different. If anyone wants... Um, details on insurance so we I've worked really hard over the last nine months to create fit for purpose insurance products that are specifically for rent to rent specifically for sources broken deals and things like that um, I can give you my broker's numbers he's got those fit for purpose policies that are um, that understand the back end and the intricacies of things like rent to rent and HMO and all that sort of stuff so that you can actually make sure that you and your landlords or you and your vendors have got the right insurances in place um, to run the houses in the way that you're running them. So just ping me a Facebook message or if you put in the comments, I can make sure I send that on email or something like that. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. What other questions have we got in this thing, Nick? Have you seen any? Got a lot of questions. Um, um, Kaylee, so Kaylee, like, yeah, what did Kaylee say? I have a meeting with an agent on Saturday, but I'm actually sure why I'm going. What would, what, what would plan? What plan would you go with, Kaylee? What kind of, um, what, what was the premise of the meeting? Have you got a house in mind, or are you just going to chat? See, I'll, I'll, I'll just answer quickly with what I do. So, I basically rock up. I've got my sales pitch ready. I go in there, I go, hey, I'm Nick from Pegasus Property. I'm the director. You might have heard of us because our boards are everywhere. Um, we've bought 30 properties this year, all cash. All my clients are based abroad. They're all mainly expats living in Hong Kong and Dubai. They're cash rich, but they're time poor. And I am their representative in the UK. And basically, I've got access to millions of pounds in cash. So what have you got for me? What deals have you got right now? If you've got a deal and it ticks my boxes, and these are my boxes that I want ticking. And I tell them, I want a three bed between uh, 80 and 100K. I want a four bed between 100 and 130K. Um, I want a two bed between, you know, 40 and 60K. They're sort of my parameters that I go with off the top, off the top of my head. I know that those will stack for me as HMOs. I go in there with that and basically they sit there and go, oh, let me get the manager, you know, and then the manager comes out and then I say the same thing to him. And they might say, sorry, mate, we ain't got anything in right now. And that's cool because I just say, look, you know who I am. Is my business is my business card. I'm not fucking around. I'm serious. If you want to see proof of funds, I've got proof of funds. Um, let's rock and roll. Like, you know, if you've got any sticky deals or you've got any deals that just come on the market that you can't be bothered uh, marketing because that obviously costs you money and time doing viewings, save yourself the time, save yourself, um, you know, the 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 person power of having agents who have to go out and do viewings, um, just come straight to me, come straight to me and I'll buy it. And that's what I go in and say. And most of the time they're blown away and they're ringing me straight away. They're ringing me all the time. Um, so that's what I do. <laughs> and it's, it's no, it's not much different to me. The only difference is I don't go into meetings. Um, I suppose you'd say I'm pretty lazy actually. I do everything from my desk. Um, I don't go and see houses. I don't go and meet agents. If people, if I do have meetings, they come to me in my office and, and we do it here. Um, mainly because I wanted to create a life for myself where I wasn't tied to being driving all over the place to make my business work. You know, last year I did, I ran my business from Thailand for a month. I ran it from Australia for a month. Um, you know, I I don't like to be driving around and going to meetings and agents and things like that. It's just the, the, the business I chose to create. You don't have to do it like that. Um, and by the way, I'm not saying that I live a laptop lifestyle because I definitely do not. Um, I just did a bit of work while I was in those places, did a couple of deals and it, it paid for my trip. So um, I still come to work every day. You know, I'm in the office at quarter past nine at night. I still work hard. Um, 
But in terms of meeting with an agent, Kaylee, what I'd say is just be honest. Yeah, be just ask her, the lady that you're meeting, what she thinks you what problems she has you know has she got particular issues with um particular types of landlords particular types of properties particular areas how can you help her it's like we've talked about already i don't care who you're working with the only way you'll be successful is by finding out what problems they have and going away and finding a solution to that problem so don't go into that meeting with in mind i'm going there to talk to her about rent to rent because actually you might find that she wants to talk to you about things that are where she gets properties bought to her which aren't selling and actually what that means is that they need to put a tenant in but they do want to sell so you've got yourself an option there instead of just a direct rent to rent so go in and tell her about you kaylee i've met you you know we've spoken loads of times you can't i've I met you in milton Keynes, and you come across really credible you know that so go in and be you deliver you and tell her what you do, tell her how you can help her in all the different ways. And you'll find that actually, she might not have a deal for you now, that's okay. Once you've had your meeting, then speak to her consistently. Consistency is what it takes to be successful in this. It's people that have the meeting and then never follow up, they're the people that fail. The people that have the meeting and then follow up, they're the people that do well. So I'd say just make sure you follow up with her, Kaylee, and be you. Other than that, it, it's it kind of there is no real me formula. And another thing I'll just quickly say is that a lot of people teach, um, you know, go into the estate agent's office with a, with a, with some donuts and cakes, and I don't buy into that. I I buy more into like I'm the authority. I'm the person that they need me. Basically, it's not the other way around. I, it's all about problem solving. Yeah, like you've got to get in the head of an agent. If you go into an agency. Or you're doing a viewing and some young lad or lady comes along and you can tell they're quite new you can tap into that massively you can go to them and say how long have you been working at this company for and they're like oh four weeks now and you can go awesome i can groom this person <laughs> not in a weird way but you, you can no, that's illegal, right? i don't know but you, you can basically get you can get into their head and be like look um you know i want to go find property i'm going to be around for a long time you're obviously new if you get any deals that come in and you want to get your stats up come to me like because i'll get your stats up because anything that you're selling that ticks my boxes i'm going to buy it and you get that into their heads or you go to the manager because they're probably the ones that get the best deals or the, the higher up senior agents and they've probably heard it all before but you've got to get in their heads if they're on a commission basis the more they sell it for the more money they make so if you go in there putting daft offers in which is what a lot of people teach go in put 10 stupid offers in and one might go i don't really agree with that i think that's a bad tactic because you just get yourself a bad name and, and basically they think... But I have con something controversial to add to this, okay? So I actually agree. You said something about BMV earlier and you're not believing that it's, some it's not real. Yeah. I actually don't believe in BMV either. I think it's a bullshit rule, a bullshit term that people talk about because ultimately something is only worth what someone will pay for it. So if the only person that's going to buy it is you and your offer is X price, then it's not below market value, it's market value. There's a little controversial spin on this. So, and I've talked to this about, you know, with, I think probably with Kaylee and Jermaine when I met you last week, there's this really cool thing called above market value. Now, I will happily offer above market value, above asking price just to get the deal done because yeah. it doesn't matter what you're buying it at if the profits and the numbers stack. So, if it means you have to offer just that little bit more to secure it, please, guys, do not feel like you have to knock an agent down to 30% below asking price, otherwise it's not a deal, is nonsense. It really is. What you need to do is look at the numbers. How does it make it a deal for you? Okay, not anyone else, your buyers or you. If it works and you can pay 25 grand above market value, then do it because it'll be you that gets the deal and it'll be you that sees the profit. It's yeah. honestly... Well, I, 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 totally agree. I totally agree with that. I mean, it depends what strategy you're doing. If your strategy is cash flow based, then the commodity with cash flow based strategies is time. The longer you have the investment for, the more money it makes. So in hindsight, you know, I've lost loads of deals where I've tried to haggle on two thousand pounds, five thousand pounds, things like that. When I look back and I think, what a dickhead, because if I would have just secured it at the asking price or whatever, um, three years down the line, I you know, I would have been I'd be making loads of money. So when you start and I'm not I don't want to say like go out and offer over market value, but 
you know, you've got to be practical. If you look at the deal and it's 100K and that's the asking price and I look at the numbers and go, fuck me, if I spend 50K on this and I turn it into a seven bed HMO and it's worth 200K when I'm finished because I can get potentially commercial finance on it or whatever um, and I'm now making two grand a month net profit, which is 24K a year, why the hell am I haggling over £2,000, £5,000? And the amount of people that I see doing that and losing out on deals and they never do a deal. They're just sat there waiting for years for a deal to come along, that's perfect. And and in that time, they could have bought three or four deals and made all their money back. But they don't think that way. They think with a flipping mentality. And that's what I call it, people who flip properties, which is standard, right? You buy cheap, you do it up as economically as you can, and you sell it for the most amount of money. That's fine if you're flipping property, if that's what your game is. But if you're holding assets and you're doing cash flow, then um, actually you want to buy something in a good area, which means you might have to pay market value, the full market value or whatever that is. Um, and you might have to do an expensive refurb because you want it to be proper and you want it to last for 20, 30 years. So you, your mindset needs to, you need to think like that. You need to think more along those lines rather than thinking buying cheap, doing it up cheap. You're not selling it, you're keeping it. <laughs> you know, you're not selling it up. You wouldn't go and buy a car and then, you know, put like a shit engine in it because you've got to drive the thing around forever. So, you know, it's anyway, that's my opinion, but that's what I've done for a while now and um, it's worked out well for me. So, Kaylee's just asked, what would we split deals for fees? Kaylee, are you talking about if you got a deal through an agent, how do you split the fee with the agent? Is that what you're asking me? Because I just want to double check that. Okay, you don't split the fee with the agent. The agent gets paid by finding a tenant or finding a buyer. They get paid anyway. You don't. If you incentivize the agent, that's technically called bribing the agent, and um, that's definitely illegal. So you're not allowed to brown envelope an agent anymore, and they're not allowed to accept a fee from both the buyer and the seller. So they make their money by selling the house. You make your money by finding the buyer. You keep your fee. They keep their fee. It's very it's neat and tidy. You don't need to split fees with the agents. They get paid their bit. Sometimes they want to increase their fees slightly. Sometimes they want to bolt in admin fees and bits and pieces. It happens. You need to figure it out. But you're not allowed to actually incentivize um, because that is deemed bribery. So, yeah, don't do that. Um, yes, Kaylee, they get paid from the vendor. You get paid from the investor. That is 100% accurate. Um, Dare, Dare, is it Dare or Dairy? I'm not sure. Sorry. Um, asked about um, up here. Do you get heads of terms such as details, detail the sourcing, PM and management of it? Um, I think what you're asking is do you get heads of terms before you complete or, or before you appoint solicitors? Is that what you're asking? Just so that I can, or it might be a Nick question actually, but just well, so I, can I, I, I actually answered him. I basically said that, yeah, I've got a sourcing agreement oh. and a project management agreement, which I get them to electronically sign. It probably wouldn't stand up in a court of law, but yep. it's something that just commits them a little bit to an agreement that they sign and it just makes it a bit more, you know, the commitments there basically. So yeah, I get them to sign a sourcing agreement. I do the project management of the renovation, so I get them to sign that as well. Um, you know, so it's all laid out for you, but I, I get my sourcing fees 100% up front for all my projects. I don't take um, deposits. I say, look, if you want this deal and it's three grand, I want three grand in my bank account now. If that's a problem, then don't, you know, don't do the deal. And that separates a lot of people who are serious and not serious. People who trust me will give me the money. I say, look, if the deal falls out of bed and it's no one's fault, I'll give you the money back. There's no, there won't be any arguments over it. I'll just give it back to you. And people that trust me with that, they become my good clients. People that are like, oh, no, I don't like the sound of that. I don't do upfront sourcing fees. I go, well, fuck off then. That's just the way I do business and it works for me. Um, you know, I just want to quickly answer another question because Dare or Dairy Dairy or whatever is I don't know how to pronounce it. But sorry, Dairy, that we can't pronounce your name. I'm not sure either. Sorry. But, sorry, but he, he asked a question which is quite cool. Which was um, people talk about getting all cash out from residential to HMO deals. Is it just a myth or is it real? Um, so just quickly want to touch on that subject. So a lot of people teach this strategy, which is like you buy a two bed house, you get three bedrooms in there because you get a bedroom on a, uh, a reception room on the ground floor. And now it's worth like a million pound because you get a commercial remortgage. And that's all bollocks, basically. That doesn't work that way whatsoever. Um, wherever you can get commercial lending, it's all based, it's case by case basis. So it depends on you. 
when you do commercial lending, it's not like a computer saying yes or no, like it is with residential and buy to let. With commercial, they look at you. A broker will build a profile on you. So they look at what businesses you've run, what your debt's like, what assets you've got, what property experience you've got. They look at all of these things and they build a profile on you and then they shop you out to the commercial lenders. And then they turn around and say, yes, we, you know, Shawbrook will come and say, yes, we would lend on this individual or no, we would not lend on this individual. So there's not really many rules of thumbs, but a couple rule of, rule of rules or thumbs that do exist is that you have to have a HMO for 12 months minimum, minimum uh, to be considered an experienced HMO landlord. So if you go and buy a three bed or a four bed residential C3 property, and you convert that under permitted development into a six bedroom all en suite HMO, for example, um, would you get commercial lending on that, yes or no? It's kind of a gray area. So if you went to someone like Kent Reliance or Precise Mortgages, they would do a bricks and mortar valuation. If you went to Shawbrook, they would take the gross rental income and they would use a multiplier to work out what the commercial value of that property is. The commercial value would normally be higher than the bricks and mortar value, but not in all cases. So you need to work that out yourself when you're analyzing the deal. Um, and wherever you would actually be able to get the commercial lending or not is another question. So you need to go to a commercial broker, and I know a good one. Uh, I don't know if I'm allowed to do shout outs, but Mark Haywood from What's Commercial Finance is the broker that I use. I don't get kickbacks uh, or anything like that. Um, so, you know, he will basically assess you and he will tell you if you would be able to get commercial lending or not on the exit. And that's important because if your strategy is around momentum investing, which is where you get all your money back um, and you can't get your money back because you didn't bother to ask the question, can I get commercial lending or not? Then you're kind of fucked. So, um, you know, worst case scenario is you get your first HMO, you'd have it for 12 months and then you're considered an experienced HMO landlord, which means that all these doors open to you with the commercial lenders. Yeah. One One little word of caution, though, is that, when you do commercial lending and they value it higher than the bricks and mortar value, that means you are over leveraging yourself above the bricks and mortar value. What that means is, is that if you default on payments or things go tits up or whatever, basically you're giving those keys back to them and you're walking away having, you've got no equity in it. Because if the bricks and mortar value is 200K and they do a commercial valuation of 230K and they lend you 75% of 230K, you're basically giving them the keys back and walking away from that deal having lost all your money. So what I do is, is I look at the ROI and I look at my uh, repayment um, repayment months, which is on my deal analyzer. So I, I risk assess it by going, well, the ROI is like 40%. So I'm going to make my money back. I'm going to be clear within like two and a bit years. Do I think for the next two and a bit years, the HMO market's going to still be going? Is it still going to be stable? And how do I work that out? I don't really. I'm just guessing like everybody else. Yeah, I think the HMO market will still be going in the next five to 10 years time. So that's what I base my risk assessment on. If you don't feel that way or your market's really saturated, whatever that means, or there's potential regulation things on the horizon, like council tax banding per room could destroy the HMO market. You know, uh, things like that, you, you know, you got uh, you got to think of those things and assess them basically when you're analyzing your deal for yourself or your clients. So, um, Michael asked me a question about agent uh, fees, which I think is Michael Sanford. If it is, hello, Mr. Sanford. Um, the when you're sourcing rent to rent for an agent, okay, there's some really um, it's a slightly different twist on the numbers because with an agent, they want to keep the maintenance and the management of the house because with an agent, they make money on that. So the second you walk into an agent's office and say, it's okay, Mr. Agent, we're going to absorb all the work, all the management, all the everything, they're going to say, fuck off, because I make a margin on that. Every agent in the country puts money on top of the cost of the contract that goes out to do the work. So if the plumber that goes out to fit the whatever costs 50 quid, they'll charge the client 75. Okay, so if you start trying to take that away from an agent, they are not going to want to work with you. When you're working with landlords, you want to take the management and the maintenance and everything away from them because that's the problem they've got. That's what they need a solution for. There's two ways to negotiate rent to rent. When you're dealing with agents, we, we pay them their rent as a tenant. All you're doing in rent to rent is becoming a tenant. So nothing changes in the process of becoming a tenant with a letting agent. You become a tenant, you sign your contract, making sure it's the right contract, not an AST or a management agreement or any other ridiculous contract that people are training in this 
ridiculous industry. Um, you sign your contract as a tenancy, you pay your rent. The agent takes their cut, their 10% plus VAT or their whatever they charge. They then pay the rest to the landlord. The landlord then is charged when the washing machine breaks. The agent will arrange it and the agent will charge the landlord and so on and so forth. So the agent keeps their fees. When you're trying to source for an agent, you never, ever, 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 ever try and take away their money. Because as Nick alluded to earlier, agents are not very well paid typically. Um, in Milton Keynes, the average salary for an experienced agent is between 12 and 15 grand a year. So that what that means is they're reliant on the commission and they add money to every possible thing. And that is why they charge so many different things. So when you're dealing with your agent, don't try and take away their money because they won't want to work with you. Um, Annette's asked me, if you're managing the property, then surely you are the one who sorts out the problems, not with an agent. Because again, there's very much a, mis a confusion around rent to rent in our industry, okay? When you are rent to rent in, you're a tenant. You're not a managing agent, you're a tenant. You should be signing tenancy agreements, not management agreements, okay? So with an agent, they are the managing agent. So they should be managing the property. The landlord pays them to do that and they then find the tenant, that's it. So no, with regards to the agents, that's, we, we don't want to do the managing bit. With landlords, we offer a slightly different service because we become the tenant in the same way, but as the tenant, we absorb the work of the maintenance. We, we get our tradies to do it instead because that's what's attractive to a landlord. So I hope that clears things up. Um, and that's also why you, anyone running rent to rent should not be running them on management agreements unless they are VAT registered and running a vatable business. So service accommodation is a vatable business. Actually, yes, probably management agreement. If you're running true rent to rent, then you are doing multi-lets or back-to-backs, then you absolutely shouldn't be signing management agreements unless you are VAT registered. So if there's any need any clarity on that, just ask me. Because there's so many people that are running rent to rent businesses at 20% profit, because that's kind of the industry standard. And then the VAT man's going to fly in in a minute and take your 20% and you'll have been working for three years for nothing. All because the big room trainers train management agreements incorrectly. <laughs> Annoyingly. So any other questions now I get off my little rant? <laughs> Sorry. My bad. Any other questions, guys? Let's have a look. There's loads of rent to rent questions. I wish I could answer some, but... I've That's never... right, find them at me because I've missed them all. Do you know I've, what they're in? Uh, I've never done rent to rent before, so I don't know. So, Michael, if, you're on, if you are on a tenancy, who do you, what do you give to your tenants? Okay, so when I talk about tenancy, I don't mean an AST. As a company, you are not legally allowed to sign an AST. So when you become the tenant, you cannot sign an AST because an AST is a contract that's designed to protect human beings under the Housing Act. The Housing Act is a human being piece of legislation. It doesn't protect companies. The Housing Act is designed to protect deposits of human beings and designed to protect the people, the human beings. So as a business entity, we can't sign an AST. We have to sign, I, well, the ideal contract is a common law tenancy, which is a, um, or you've got commercial leases, depending on the type of property. You've got company let agreement, but with a company let agreement, it has to be restructured to allow for subletting because all company agreements that come through will have no permission to sublet. And it will also talk about employees. Now, unless you're planning on putting employees of your business in that house, then that is not a fit for purpose contract. It needs to be restructured to have your permitted occupiers as a business. So contractors, workers, workforce, whatever you're doing. Otherwise, it's not the right contract. There's so many people, I, I was looking at um, somebody's paperwork this week and um, their whole business is built on management agreements and they've never charged a penny VAT. And actually, if HMRC roll in, they're gonna lose all their profits, which is very frustrating for them. And you know, this the, the contract side of rent to rent, Rent to rent in its truest form, you are becoming a tenant, you're getting permission to sublet. That's it. So you should sign tenancies with permission to sublet granted. There shouldn't be any other agreements in place. In terms of what we give our tenants, if you... ...is on the types of tenants. Oh, so I hope on. that answers your question. 
you're back. Did that answer your question, Michael? Sorry, total rant. It does frustrate me though. <laughs> Perfect, thanks, you good. Good, good. Any other questions about rent to rent while I'm on one? Uh, what is the fastest time from agreeing to purchase to completing? Well, it depends, mate. I mean, if, if you're using lending to buy it, then it can take a lot longer. But if you're doing it with cash, then people can do searches, all the surveys, and complete in four to six weeks. Um, David, would you go in as a relocation agent? It depends what business you're running. So I run a relocation company and I run a lettings company. Um, depending where we are and what we're who we're sourcing for depends on how we go in. Um, so, you know, if your intention is to put um, DSS tenants into a rent to rent or students into a rent to rent, then no, obviously don't go in as a relocation agent. It's lying. It's misleading. If you're going to focus on recruit or recruiting, that was the recruitment brain in me for a second. If you're going to focus on working professionals that are working on projects or relocating into an area or um, moving around within an area and it's working people and actually you are providing a relocation service in your business, then yeah, go in as a relocation company. It depends on what you are going to do. We don't all do the same thing under rent to rent. You know, we've got rent to rents that are um, HMOs for unemployed people, very few of them, but we've got them. We've got uh, rent to rents which are service accommodation. We've got rent to rents which are back to backs. We've got rent to rents which are corporate lets. We've got rent to rents which are just working people. So it depends what you're going to use that house for. But yeah, I run a relocation company specifically for that side of the market. And then we've got our lettings business which sits on the other side of the market as well. So I hope that answers that question. Good, excellent, let's have a look. Any other questions, guys? Michael, is rentable income subject to VAT? No, okay, but management income is subject to VAT. So if you're providing a management service, services are VATable, but rental income is not VATable. So I hope that answers that question. Speech or accounting is the best advice here. So again, I have to just put a bit of a disclaimer. Um, I am not professionally qualified to advise you on VAT and tax and things like that, but I can absolutely recommend my accountant. Um, they're, they're called Ad Valorum. They're in Milton Keynes. The guy called George is my contact there. Call them and they will confirm. Vatable, vatable income, if it's management income, it's vatable. You should be charging VAT to your client. Um, if it's rental income and you're a tenant, you don't need to charge VAT. But check with an accountant. Um, what else have we got? Yes, Kaylee, I am going to email it to everybody after this. Not immediately after, but because um, you've all signed up to this webinar, that means I've got all your email addresses, so I'm going to be spamming you. <laughs> uh, so you will you will get some stuff off me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no problem, Michael. I reckon we're probably about done. I, I can't see any questions in here that haven't been answered. So let's stay for like maybe five more minutes or three more minutes. Let's see if we've got time for a few more questions. Also, I've just seen how ridiculous my nails look on screen. I lost a nail today. Please don't judge me. <laughs> <laughs> are, are you recording this, by the way? Yeah, it's being recorded. Well, the software should be recording it. Yeah. Um, how did we meet? We've actually never met. In per in person, have we? Have we? No, 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 I mean, I just put out on Facebook like a couple of weeks ago saying, does anyone want to do webinars with me? And um, I did one with Julian Maurice a couple of weeks ago, which was really good. That was about HMO design. Um, and this is my second one now, which is with Sarah. So um, I'm going to keep doing webinars. I want to keep it like this, basically content. No, no, no selling. We are selling things. You know, don't get me wrong. We're selling things in the, the day. Do you know what I mean? I've, I've got my Unity project thing um you know and in pegasus property but i'm not here to try and sell you that shit i'm just here to add content and you know if people people that know me know that i basically just um i do loads of videos on youtube i do loads of blog posts my my method has always been to basically give away the trade secrets and become an authority on the subject that i'm talking about and what as that you, means as you can tell from his picture by the way <laughs> yeah exactly so that was a, that was a joke picture by the way 
So, uh, but whatever. That's why I chose. Uh, okay. Excellent. <laughs> you got to be able to laugh at yourself, but yeah, no, I mean, yeah, if you make yourself an authority on a subject and you start list building, and that's what I do, I, I build lists. So I've got my website, I've got my YouTube channel, I've got Facebook, you know, I funnel people through. People know that I do bill sourcing, so people sign up to my website for that. And that's how I build the list of people that I source my deals to. You know, I, 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 um, I, I sourced a deal the other day in about five minutes because I use an SMS text messaging service. So I've got a list of my verified investors and I've got all their telephone numbers. And there's about 65 of them. And um, I send a text out. They get my deals first via text. And people open a text message within the first 60 seconds of receiving it, typically. Like 90% of people or something open it in the first 60 seconds. I've got people ringing me saying, I want that deal, Nick. What's your bank account details? I'll send you the source of fee now. And it's easy. It's really easy. But you've got to build up that authority. People have got to know who you are. It's all about time and experience. It becomes easy when you put the work in at the beginning to perfect your craft. It becomes easy once you work hard. It doesn't become easy overnight. And I know that that's not what Nick's saying. But what everyone needs to understand is that, you know, you, like we, need to put the effort in. So... For example, I had a conversation yesterday with someone who said to me, who is one of my one-to-one -one training and said, well, I made four calls this week. Okay, great. Their target's 10 grand a month. Like, do you honestly think that you're worth 10 grand a month when all you've done is pick up the phone four times? Like, are you drunk? You know, it, <laughs> it's, it's not, you have to think to yourself, what's a fair exchange for the work I'm putting in and the effort I'm putting in? As your business grows, you might work less and you'll earn more. But to start with, you have to put in more effort and be prepared to work a bit less. So, guys, please don't think that all of a sudden you're going to be able to have a calculator and a few like notes on where to look online and you're going to be able to build 10 grand a month because you're not. You know, it's taken me two years to get to a run rate of about 30 grand a month. And that's where I sit now. But it took me a long time. You know, I've had months where I've built nothing. It happens. But at the same time, I put in the effort and I'm, I'm in the office till 10 o'clock at night. I am up early doors. You know, I am texting all the time. It, 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 it's a business. Run it like a business. You're not just going to wake up tomorrow and, and have 30 grand sat in your bank. It's not going to happen. Put the effort in. That's Again, it. But so, so, sourcing is a great strategy for like, source, sourcing, lettings, rent to rent. All that stuff is like very little startup money. So um, as a result, it is plagued with um, amateurs. That's, I don't use that word in a negative way. Um, you know, we all start off at some point. We're all amateurs when we first start doing property. Um, but it's just really about being ethical, being as ethical as you can. Having a moral compass is important. Uh, I know that it can be very tempting in business when you see the, the money to, to, to chase it and be greedy. But you really got you really got to think about the future. You got to think about your reputation. You got to think about your name. You want to build a brand. You want to build trust with people, and that's where you make m the millions. Not in getting a quick three k for a deal, which is shit, and running away. That's going to get you absolutely nowhere. Um, and the industry is full of those people, and that's why it gets a bad name. So what you got to do is you got to be crystal clear you got to be super ethical you got to be super upfront with people i saw stuff off right move sometimes i do you know i go on right move and if i see a deal that stacks i go fuck me i bring the client up and i go i'm not going to shop it out to my list because then everyone goes uh, nick source and stuff off right move you know so I, I ring people directly and go yo this is on right move but just give me a thousand pound sourcing fee and that's just for me basically notifying you of it i'm putting my stamp of approval on it I'm going to do the floor plans for free, all the design for free. That's worth 500 quid. And I upsell myself to it. And by, by the time I finish the conversation, they go, Nick, take two grand, mate, because you've done a good job. And that's what you've got to do. Uh, most of my stuff is direct defender, however. But, you know, I will source stuff off right move. you just got to not be a knob about it. <laughs> Don't so I, put, I, put, I put two offers out today on development deals that are on right move. But... Mm -hmm. The offer I put in will be very different to the offer that everyone else will put in. And mm -hmm. it's about that, the effort in, in actually going and securing it a different, a, a, in a different way to what's available on Right Move. So, what I don't want you guys to think is that, oh shit, I shouldn't be looking on Right Move. Look on Right Move, go and speak to them, but don't just like download a link and post it on Right Move, on um, Facebook and say, I've found this deal. And it's the same price as the uh, opportunity on Right Move because that's not, you've not done any work for that. You know, if you go on right move and you speak to the agent, you manage to secure it at, I don't know, 30 grand below what it's on right move for, 
then potentially you're looking at it being a deal and that's when you when it's okay to to use deals from right move but yeah don't just copy and paste that's very frustrating <laughs> cool well i need to go because um i've got a gap at six o'clock in the morning because i'm driving 1600 miles to spain um so yeah 25 hours of driving basically it's brutal so, are you taking your dog nick no, my dog's uh, been looked after by a guy. He's like a he's like a hippie, but he's a dog. He looks after dogs, but he's like a hippie. So he's got all this like om music going on, and they're, like you know little incense things, and the dogs are like meditating, and that is, is amazing. So I'm interested to know what's on your playlist for your 25 hour journey. <clears throat> well, I normally listen to Pink Floyd and stuff like that, like nice chilled out music. But because um, it's a long drive, I'm just going to listen to. Um, um, I think I'm going to listen to Money by Rob Moore. I know Ooh, it's about that right now. I love it. It's good. Yeah. So good. I mean, I'm not I'm not a big like clappy clappy progressive person or whatever. But um, it's end of the day, it's a good it's a good read. It's a good uh, it's a good audio thing. There's some good information in there, so I'm gonna I'm gonna listen to it. You know. Yeah. I think I think, I think I think we become like really like a lot of people in business become very arrogant and they're like, oh, I'm not going to listen to that person because they because I'm older than them. I know more than them. And that's when you that's when you come unstuck because the second you you close your mind up and you stop learning, you get overtaken. Um, so you need to, you need to you need to innovate and watch other people and learn off them and be humble, basically. So we better go. Well, my husband's been divorcing me, and you're going to fall asleep at the wheel. So that's no good for anybody involved. And um, guys, I personally would like to say thank you very much for staying on. You know, it's almost ten o'clock at night, and you're here with us, which you could be in a million other places. So thank you very, very, very much. Um, if you need anything from me personally, the best way to get hold of me is probably Facebook, unless you've got my number. Um, you can go on the Property Sourcing Hub, which is my Facebook group. Just join it and ping your questions in there or send me a private message. Nick, what's the best way to get hold of you? Um, just go on uh, pegasuspg.com. That's my website. You can go on there and you can contact me through there. And I've got YouTube as well. You can contact me through there and Facebook uh, and Instagram. <laughs> and twitter <laughs> excellent so guys thank you very much nick thank you for it's been fun yeah um it's been a real pleasure um i've actually really enjoyed this i was really nervous at the start but actually it's been it's been quite good so <laughs> i'll speak to you soon safe trip. okay yeah. See you guys. Bye. Bye. bye 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 i'm still on i think i'm supposed to leave at this point just press your little um microphone and camera you'll go <laughs> it's, a good thing it's, not, it's a good thing I'm not saying anything dodgy. Right, see you later.